I notice people when they come up and kneel, take somebody to pull them back up. That's why I don't kneel. I did something to my back this week. I lifted something. I can't remember what it was. But, you know, that's what the church is about, pulling each other up, right? Get down, start to hurt, can't get back up. You don't sit there and laugh at somebody that can't get up. <laughs> you know, I remember when I just jump up. Remember that? I also remember when I went to the beach, I'd slap on tan and lotion and just slap it on, man. Now it looks like I'm doing the Macarena. Got to make sure I get everywhere. Well, God bless you guys. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I just thank you that you're always here through your Holy Spirit in the name of your Son. And Lord, I know that salvation is salvation of our spirits that works out into our bodies, our emotions, our personalities. And so, Father, we don't want to put any limitations on what you can do. If you're here, you can do anything you want to do. And we want to give you permission. And we expect you to work in ways that we don't understand and can't control. So we pray for physical problems. We pray for emotional issues. We pray for minds to be healed. And we pray for bodies to be healed. And, Lord, we want to be a witness to anything that you might be doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my friend wrote, wrote a book, Adventure of the Supernatural Discovery. And uh, he wrote it. We went, Shay and I went to uh, Brazil with a group of people, twice, actually. That was a really good uh, mission trip. And we met Michael Kaler there. And uh, we saw him not long ago. He actually lives down in Ackworth. And uh, so he uh, showed me, gave me one of his books, The Adventure of Supernatural Discovery. And I'm thinking, you know, that's pretty much what I was so excited about when I started this Christian walk. It's like, wow, it's a supernatural discovery. I've always just lived for myself and lived, you know, but now I'm, I'm actually going to see what God can do in my life. And that was pretty exciting. Anybody remember how excited you were? when you came up out of the waters of baptism and you started your journey, and you remember how you kind of cooled off along the way because things didn't quite go your way, or you, it, was not a, it, was, it was a marathon, not a sprint. I thought any moment Jesus was going to come when I came up all those waters. I remember driving back from Lexington down to West Virginia, and I was looking for him to come any moment in the clouds because there was that expectation that the Holy Spirit was bringing to me that I'd never experienced before. That's why I love to hear you speak, Jeff. I mean, you, you are like this, you know, there, there's no performance involved in you. And uh, it's, it's awesome. And also thank you for that Bible. Jeff, they brought me, a, brought me a new Bible, and my life's been different ever since. That's a big Bible. Remember me telling about my Bible falling off the top of my car? and going all over the place down the road. And so without, you know, Jeff and Leslie, without any, you know, Lindsay, sorry. Okay, I won't. Without me saying, hey, the Lord told, told me to tell you to buy me a Bible. That's manipulation, isn't it? When people freely give because they want to, that's called a gift. So, you know, you have things that you can freely give to people gifts that you can give and uh, people really appreciate it when it wasn't expected that's the thing about a job they expect you to work you get paid to work but when somebody freely gives you something that they didn't expect you didn't have to they appreciate it more and that's what's so good about serving and doing anything we can to people that we don't have to do it to they they really appreciate it so that's my little spill on that. I don't know what I'm going to do this service. I always have the same outline, and, you know, and then I take off. You know, I had a chairman of the board, our first church, when in our 20s. He was uh, the county lawyer. He was really dry, and nobody really liked his personality until he was running for office and suddenly he changed. It's like, Bill, talk. he said hello to me four times when I passed him. 
But anyway, he said uh, one night I was talking Sunday night, teaching, and, and I heard him mumbling. He was always mumbling something back there. And I said, hey, Bill, would you like to share that with the class? He said, yeah. He said, you got the gift, the ability to talk until you can think of something to say. Well, you know, that can, that can help him. But, you know, have, the thing with Jeff, man, you just, it's so pure and sincere. So just keep it up. Well, I want to talk about, continue our series on finding love right where we are. And today I'm talking about where God wants us to find it. We're always looking for love in all the wrong places or out there somewhere when really the place where God has made to put love into is our heart. That's why Jesus spoke so much about the heart. Not that he was trying to condemn them, but that he was saying that the heart has been created for God to live in. And so I want to talk about, now, in the New Testament, in the Bible, the word heart is more than just our emotions. That's part of it. But the heart stands for our thinking, the intellect, our will, our decision-making, and our emotions. So it's all of it together. So God says he's going to send his Holy Spirit to give us a new heart, a new thinking, new emotions, and also the heart directs the body. You know, you know where your, your body will go and your car will go in the direction of your head. That's why there's so many secondary, second wrecks, accidents, when people are rubbernecking. You know, people going along and you start rubbernecking, guess which way your car is going to go, the direction of your head. So I know my body is going to follow where my mind is. And that's why I had an accident about a couple, three months ago. I was rubbernecking up in Knoxville as somebody had had an accident. I just never realized that the cars in front of me might suddenly stop. And I didn't realize how long I'd been looking at this other accident. But, you know, a minute, it's like that when you're going 50, 60 miles an hour. So I was looking and watching this guy, and all of a sudden, that oh god awful sound. <laughs> I've heard it many times over the years. Anybody ever had an accident? Oh, that was bad. Thank God I had insurance, and we got it uh, fixed, and that was all good. But... Your, head, your body, your car will go in the direction that you're looking. So be careful about distracted driving. And, you know, I like to see everything on both sides of the road and to the ridge. And especially animals. Any guys in here, I can spot a squirrel or an animal for half a mile. It's like Shay said, I can't believe all the animals you see. I said, I don't know if it's the hunter's thing or you're distracted, but I see anything moving except cars in front of me. That's where I should be looking. So I think the church is like that, and sometimes we are like that. We're looking at everything except Jesus. Remember uh, Paul said, set your heart, your mind on things above, on Jesus? Because if we got it on Jesus, our life generally is going to go in the right direction. So today I want to talk about our heart. That's where God lives. That's where the Holy Spirit has been sent to live. And, and I put, that's where he lives too because there's two people that live in there, us and him. Who's going to call the shots? We had a friend one time. Uh, she was real sarcastic. She was kind of a hard egg, used to live in Reno. But we loved her. She, she just had an evangelistic heart, and people just loved her. Judy Schumacher. Anybody kin to Judy? Uh, just checking. And uh, she uh, had gotten in the left lane to pass and there was this guy up in front that was driving 45 mile an hour in the left lane is that ever irritating anybody that if you're going to if you're going to go slow that's what the right lane's for don't get in the left lane and linger that drives me nuts and so this guy had gotten in the left lane was driving slower than the people in the right lane and so judy was trying to pass him and wouldn't and on his bumper sticker it said God is my co-pilot. So she was so frustrated that finally she passed him when he got over in the right lane, rose the window down and says, let him drive. So sometimes we need to let him drive if he's in our heart. So I want to talk about that this morning. Some reasons why we can let God drive. Because we've been bought with the blood. 
We've been bought with the blood. He's already purchased us. Everything, our future salvation, he's purchased us. He's purchased our bodies. He's paid the price. Why should we not let him drive? You ever go pay good money for a brand new car and not drive it? Wonder how God feels. He sent his son who paid his, pro paid his blood at the cross, and now we won't let him drive. Let him drive. He's in our heart. That's where he lives. Let's look at 1 Peter 17 and 19. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He purchased us with his own blood. The Father sent his Son to purchase us, that is, our thinking, our, our emotions, our body with his own blood. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Where's Johnny? I'm auditioning. Where are you, Johnny? I want to go old school. Oh, oh he had to take his uh, son, uh, Marlowe's son, to the Marines. Now, if you think, thank God that you're not going to the Marines this morning. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to the Marines at my age or any age. And they wouldn't want me. But that's where they are. But anyway, we are washed in the blood that was paid for by the person that spilt it. That includes our bodies. Our body was included in the purchase price. Now, normally, we in the Western civilization, that would not only be Western Georgia, Western Kentucky, but Western civilization, we, we split the soul and the body into two. We had more of a Greek view of that. You know, the Greeks looked at the soul as independent from the body, and they focused on that. So the downside of that is that you can love the Lord with your soul, and your body can do whatever it wants to. In fact, there was a belief in the early church, a distorted belief, that says it really doesn't make any difference what you do with your body because the important thing is your soul. That's not Bible. The Bible says that we are spirit, soul, and body, and all of it has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 20. Flee sexual immorality. You got to run from it. You know why? Because you want to stay if you don't. You got to be like Joseph. You know, when Potiphar's wife got after him, what did he do? Did he sit there and try to resist it? No, he took off. I don't know if he was trying to lay his, be a, you know, serving God or she was dog ugly. I don't know. But it says he ran. Flee sexual immorality. Don't ha hang around and flirt with temptation. Run from it. Take off. Get out of there. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And now this is something that we just can't believe, especially in America, in, in the 20th century, 21st, whichever one it is. You are not your own. See, that's always been our problem. It's my life. No, he didn't have that right. It's not our life. Not the moment we said yes to Jesus. I mean, who did it belong to before? It was the devil. We have been redeemed from the kingdom of darkness. So there's only two owners in this world. It's the devil, which sometimes can be synonymous with me. Me, 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 my, 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 my. Even when it, people get in the church, my church, my salvation, my, my leadership, my ministry. No, there's only one ministry. That's his ministry. So getting this thing from my own, we have been bought with the price. The precious blood of Jesus. So our bodies belong to God too. Now, Shay's going to do, uh, we're going to do some prayer team training today. And 
uh, I'd encourage everybody to come because this is a good thing. If you ever wanted to pray for people or pray on a, a team, we're going to go through some really stuff, practical things that you might not have thought about, about how to pray for another per person without, you know, being obnoxious or, you know, just kind of be, a, and we're going to talk about what certain words mean because sometimes God puts it in our mind when we're praying for somebody and it's not your mind, it's for them. So those kind of things. So c come today, make time, 2 o'clock right here in the front. But this word that she's going, Shay's going to be bringing up today, it's called sozo, S-O-Z-O. -O. Sozo is another word for salvation. Salvation in the Greek means salvation of the body, soul, and spirit. So never did salvation just mean going to heaven. It, mean, it meant heaven coming here and controlling our mind, our body, and our spirit. That makes sense? Have you heard that before? Have you thought about it? Just checking. You know, one of the first principles of speaking is know your audience. So I don't really know you that well. But we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus and the body was included in that purchase. You know, when you buy a house, you buy the property that that house sets on, all right? And you check, where's the property line, all right? So you know where your property line is, and you know what's your, quote, yours and what's not. Now, our house in Cincinnati, it had a big side yard, but a really narrow backyard. And we had to, at one time, get it surveyed because we sold our house. And what they do is they put a stake down where you know where your property line is, right? Well, where is the property line that Jesus paid in your life? Where does it stop and start? It's everything. Everything that we are and have, that's where the property line is. And he's already purchased us with his blood. So we'll talk about that today in uh, prayer team training. Sozo prayer. All right? Now, based on that, what should I do? What do people usually call that we do when we sing on Sundays? What do they call that? Worship? Do you call listening to the word worship? Most people don't. Well, the worship band, that's the people that lead the singing. But that's just the worship in song. There's also a worship in the word. There's a worship in living. Living well is God's worship. It's good worship. Living well. That's our worship. And so if you don't really like to be, you know, like a demonstrative in your worship in church, church that's okay. You can demonstrate it as the way you live all during the week. I hate when people try to make somebody else uh, worship like them. Or just because they're not as demonstrative doesn't mean they don't worship. I've seen people... You know, hoop and holler and spill coffee all over the place and then sin like the devil. You just need to worship the way God's made you. But there, there needs to be freedom because if you stand up and raise your hands or your arms and then you got a whole back row looking at you like you, you know, just lost your head, you're not probably going to do that. We need permission in a church service to, to worship in freedom. You know, before you got here, people said, well, you, you'll know Ben. He's always running around without his shoes on. So the whole time when we first got here, I looked for somebody that was barefooted. I never did see him. And it turns out he had uh, a problem with his heel, which we prayed for, and I believe he's going to be H-E-A-L today. And uh, so he, he wore his shoes. It was hurting to not wear his shoes. And uh, so when there needs to be freedom for us to worship the Lord the way God made us. But you won't do it if you're not given permission. Basically, we kind of look around. People, I used to be in a church where they're always they were scared to death that the charismatics were going to come in. And I had a, a, a hometown pastor. Uh, he's the reason we got into ministry. That he said, yeah, be careful. Because when they start raising their arms, that's the first step. Where is it going to lead? Hey, to Jesus. There's an idea. Where does it say charismatic equals raising your arms equals bad? Only in churches that are, want everybody to look the same, be the same, and do nothing. You know, you can, raise, you can do what you want to and be celebrative anywhere else. Why not in church? 
Oh, he's stirring things up. No, I'm not. You already stirred up. But the opposite is now true in churches that have contemporary bands. That is, if you're not up and hooping and hollering, that maybe you're not into it. Hey, maybe they had a bad night. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they had to work late. Maybe there's some of my deepest worship is when I'm still. It's when I'm sitting down. I mean, every now and then, you know, you drink enough coffee, you want to get up. I mean, there shouldn't be no reason with coffee available here that people aren't excited. I say take coffee away and see if it's caffeine or the spirit. Why is it synonymous with contemporary band coffee, celebrated worship? I think it's the caffeine. But whatever it is, worship is far more than a song service. Worship is living well. It's how you live. Go uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies, bodies, to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sac sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, what's that say? You can be anything you want to in church, but if you're not living well, that ain't worship. So, isn't that nice to know that if you don't feel like worshiping on Sunday, you can worship on Monday or Tuesday or worship by, not, by being nice to the person that cuts you off on the highway. A lot of people raising arms there, but it's usually one and one finger. When we first went to our church in Cincinnati, I never got flipped off so many times in my life than right in front of our church. And a couple of times it was by one of my members. Now don't tell me you haven't done that. We're tempted to do it. Good thing about it, we don't have to do it. Just drop one finger and praise the Lord. One, one time I was on the way to church and run a little bit late and uh, somebody got behind somebody that wouldn't go on and finally got out around them and kept on trucking and I was then somebody else was driving 15 miles an hour that's why they call them Sunday drivers they're not going anywhere and so finally I pulled in the park lot and the person that I've been tailgating pulled right in front of me right into our church so I'm going, oh, shoot, I tried to go around park somewhere else, but they spotted me in the rearview mirror. And they said, well, Steve, I saw you back there. You were waving and talking. And I said, yeah, man, I was praising the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And got in church. So worship is not what you do on Sunday morning in a church service. That's part of it, but it's what we do all week long. So if you mess up worship here, you can worship down here. Just a continual worship service, what we do with our words, our mind, and our heart. That sound good? All righty. Well, living, letting God live in our heart is like living in a condo. Anybody ever lived in a condo? Yeah. Well, see, you got in a condo, they're individually owned or rented, but then you got common areas, right, where everybody pays for at the condo fees. Well, the way it is, God living in our heart, is that we are like a condo. But it's not just us. It's living among others, and we all share certain responsibilities. And so you just can't say, well, you know, I can worship God by going out by myself on the lake every Sunday. I don't have to be around people, because I can worship God a whole lot better when I ain't near people. But that's not the way God wants it. You've got to worship with everybody else. And you've got there's certain areas of life where you have to share. And that's true worship. All righty. That's about all I've got to say about that. Come on up, Michael. Did you know he had a boat, Michael? He had a boat. That's right. Hallelujah. Lead us in a closing song, Michael.